Hey, folks, Miguel Adorati back here on the MMA Museum podcast, and uh, we're into another one of our classic fight reviews. We're going back to August 19th of 2000, and we're going to watch a hook and shoot classic. This is one that I made. And, um, you know, with Jeff Osborne in the hook and shoot, this was in the War Memorial in Indiana. And this is Aaron Riley versus Steve Berger, two of the old school uh, guys that really carried the sport in that era. And, um, I've got the pleasure of being joined by my pal Genghis here to watch this. And we are also joined as an extra treat by Aaron Riley himself, uh, one of the uh, fighters in the fight. And uh, that always adds a, an extra level of fun to watching these videos because, uh, you know, the insight that the fighters can give you, especially watching a fight after he put Aaron, when was the last time you saw this fight? Uh, it's been a while. I mean, I, yeah, I couldn't say it's it's been quite a while, but I mean I've watched it since it's happened like twenty years ago. So okay, yeah. Do you go back and watch some of your old fights every, uh, every now and then? Or? Yeah, every once in a while I'll have like friends or family that will request to watch. It's not, um, and so you know I I uh, I'll end up kind of we'll do like a small viewing party or something here or there. So yeah, you know I I, I still see them, you know, every so often. That's cool. That's cool. But, uh, you know, you are it's safe to say it might be a decade since you've seen this one. Yeah, it's been it's been quite a while. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and you know, for the for the time, this is Hook and Shoot Triumph, August 19th of 2000. And I want to say that Jeff and I have been working together probably for about three years now. And you could start to see the shows starting to improve and get bigger and better. And I think that this fight here wasn't even the main event of this card um and uh i think the quality of it stands stands up for itself i think uh it's gonna look a little old school compared to what we're seeing now but at the same time it's also going to be a really hard fought fight i can safely say that neither man was paid enough <laughs> you know what i mean and uh i say that with respect because uh, we're gonna watch a, it's a long fight it's a 15 minute decision um, and, uh, you know, they gave it their all for all three rounds and, you know, that in itself is rare. A lot of people, uh, wouldn't give it their all this way, but when you're talking about Aaron Riley and Steve Berger, I think you're talking about guys that had a little bit of motivation beyond just the money. I think they, you know, Aaron was a young man growing into this thing and he wanted you know, to do this for a career stuff. And he knew he was laying the groundwork here. So it wasn't like, all right, I got my, you know, I put 500 bucks worth into this fight. I'm out of here. Uh, we got, we got our money's worth. I, I I think, Aaron, what do you remember about Berger and, and about the buildup to this fight? Well, you know, I was familiar with Steve because of the regional scene that I was, uh, you know, competing in right there in Indiana, Illinois and everything. And I know Berger had been really active with SFC, um, uh, you know, this show over in Illinois. And, right, uh, he had gone to a, a draw with Jeremy Horn, who was actually a uh, a super you know, super tough competitor at that time. And then I remember right before this fight, I believe Berger kind of went on a tear in the Iron Heart Crown that was like based out of Hammond, Indiana, or Chicago, right? Up, I mean, it's up north. And uh, he kind of went through um, Shoney Carter, and there was another guy in the. Uh, it was a four man tournament, and that so was he, a big win at the time when he beat Shoney Carter. Big right winner. exactly Genghis. yeah so that was um that was huge you know so i felt like that this was a great springboard for me to kind of get my name out there anymore i mean burger was already making noise in the regional scene and and doing things a little bit i think nationally at that point and then he really had a, a good showing there so i thought that you know a win in this hook and shoot uh fight would really kind of propel me to that next level like miguel was speaking of earlier can I ask both of you to a certain extent, uh, Miguel, this goes for you too. Um, but Aaron, you were in hook and shoot for years at this point. You had like 10 hook and shoot fights. You had been kind of Mr. Hook and shoot. We associated you with a promotion. Now mm -hmm. Berger, as you said, uh, you know, he was kind of making his name in other promotions. He had like, you know, a fight, I think in hook and shoot prior to this. Um, mm -hmm. Did you almost feel like, you were defending hook and shoot in this fight against an outsider like Miguel, where you, you're not supposed to be biased, but you know, are you hoping your guy wins against this up and coming big name there, you know, in burger? 
Aaron, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I always felt like a pressure to perform well, you know, for in, at Hook and Shoot, at home regionally there in Indiana. I always, uh, yeah, I always kind of uh, felt a pressure, we'll say, to represent you know, myself and hook and shoot well in, in any match that I did there in the Coliseum. Yeah, I, I, I take my hat off to Aaron um, because, you know, I had a, a little bit of a philosophy with matchmaking. And I it, it, part of it involved that I always wanted Aaron to win. And I always wanted him, you know, I always considered him my guy, our guy. You know, he was actually... He's probably more associated with like, like Jeff's guy, you know, because Jeff bought him along. You know, Jeff is the guy who got his mom to sign for him to do the first fight, you know, of his career when he was 16 kind of thing. So he, he was definitely more of Jeff's guy, but they both allowed me to give him tests. And th this was definitely one of those tests where it was like Aaron never said, hmm, like I, the only fight Aaron didn't seem pleased to do for me was against Phil Strafalino. And it's because I think Phil was also kind of one of those guys that was a hook and shoot guy and that they had become friends. And I don't think either guy really wanted to compete against each other, but out of respect, they, they let me do what I, you know, what I thought was good for the company. So I, I do nothing but take my hats off for him. And, it, you know, it wasn't because Aaron was worried about the fight. I, you know, Phil might've been a threat or might not have been a threat. You know, you could decide that on your own, but it was because they liked each other. They knew each other and liked each other. And Phil was more of an elder statesman at that time when Aaron was real young. And that's the only time Aaron was kind of like, I, I don't know if I want to do that one. Other than that, he always stepped up burger. Uh, the Jeremy Bennett fight I referred to was, a, 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 I think was the first fight where Aaron really, uh, you know, got challenged. Uh, it really had a, a difficult early part of the fight and then, you know, won in spectacular fashion. And so amazing win. Yeah. he followed that fight up with the burger fight. And now I think he was on his path where he was fighting real professionals and he was on his path to being, a, a you know, a top pro himself. Um, yeah, burger would have been a challenge to him. But, you know, Aaron, I remember, you know, Aaron had a tendency to put his hands in his pockets and he would just go, yep. Yeah, just be like, yeah, no problem. And ne never a problem with that. Never a problem with negotiating, never anything like that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it, but I, I certainly, in the history of Hook and Shoot, would probably call Aaron the absolute poster boy of the company. You know, from the very beginning to the end, he's he was I the agree. guy, our guy. Um, and, you know, I, I think his, his history backs it up. And the reason for that is also because of the matchmaking that he uh, accepted, you know, that he he never said no. You know, the guys he fought, Eve Edwards, Steve Berger, you know, these are all UFC level guys um, that, that he would carry our flag. You know, when we went to Texas to fight Eve, kind of in, in Eve's back, it was in Wichita Falls. Eve was from Houston. So Eve had a long road trip too. But um when we went to Texas, Aaron was the main event, you know what I mean? And this was just shortly after this. So, so here against Steve Berger, he's fighting a guy that had beat uh, Shoney Carter in a, a four man tournament in iron heart crown. He, um, and was beginning to uh, obviously be, we, we, uh, as he mentioned with the Jeremy Horn fight was obviously starting to make waves on the regional scene. And Aaron, um, had no, I I don't remember, you know, he had no worries about doing this fight. I'm going to go ahead and take us into the video at this point. We're going to do a 3-2-1. It's a two-part video out on YouTube, so we'll look at it there with everybody. Everybody turn your volumes down. We'll do a 3-2-1 and then hit play together. And uh, what we'll start off with is Aaron standing in his corner. So I'm going to go 3-2-1 play. And uh, Aaron, who's cornering you at that point? Do you recognize like, that guy? Yeah, we have uh, Dennis Holman in the background there and then Scott Hensey. Scott was a local training partner with me in Indiana. He actually made the trip uh, out to Seattle, Washington with me when we drove all the way out to Seattle, Washington. Wow. And I was meeting up with Holman and, uh, you know, I was going to spend some time out there training. So, yeah, those are two guys in my corner there. 
Okay, so this is early training out at AMC before you actually moved to Seattle. You 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 driven out there. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm trying to think. I uh when I spent the month of May um training at AMC and then I actually moved out there about a month before this fight and Henzy accompanied me and then he flew back home. Yeah. Okay, Sean is it just announced the start of the fight. They come out. Burger looks a little physically bigger, a little longer than you at this point. Um, he, I, wow, he is tall. Yeah, yeah, he is. He is a bit taller, and he, he does have boxing experience. I mean, he's uh, he won Golden Gloves as well. So yeah, he's he's definitely making use of that range, and uh, you know, kind of trying to keep me at length there, use that one two to you know possibly set up some other uh, takedown opportunities or, or or something else. But uh, yeah. He was one of the better boxers of this era, for sure. Yeah, he did have good hands. He did have good hands. He got a little slip and a little hook or a right hand, a left hand that landed there. So, Aaron yeah, he the was first kick. He didn't. Burger really doesn't kick much. He's, he's a pure boxer. You you mixing in a little bit of kicking there. Um, well, how'd you deal with? I mean, this is something you dealt with your whole career because you're kind of a stocky build, and he's a little longer than you. How, how does that translate into into your game plans and things? Um, you know, I believe I was just kind of uh, I <laughs> I started to develop some head movement earlier on, so I guess it was kind of like that Tyson style where you're just kind of trying to move side to side and close the distance to get in close. And um, you know, that's uh, that's what served me well later in my career. And you can see some stuff. There's a knee sweep. Now, see, that was something I, I picked up from Hume. Um, there were a few small techniques. It's always kind of tough, you know, when you go train with a new camp, like right before a fight, you kind of absorb a few new, new techniques. And sometimes you're, you, you can be in transition with some stuff, but, um, you know, I felt pretty, pretty comfortable coming into this. I mean, I, I picked up some new stuff. I was kind of using the knees and the kicks a little bit more in this fight. That's, that's, you know, indicative of training out there with, with Matt. Um, he's, Big time with knees. He likes leg kicks and you know, kind of a tie style a bit. Yeah, the clinch. You cl you guys are clinched. I mean, this is this this is exactly what I meant at the beginning when I introduced a fight about these guys not being paid enough. This, this is actually a pretty brutal position. You know what I mean? These the, the, those blows that they're both absorbing and dishing out there are are not for the faint of heart. You know what I mean? It's like this. They, they were already were. were in the beginning of the first round, it's already some serious business where they're trying to hurt each other, and and it shows. And I think that the, the crowd is is, is going to be pleased throughout the whole fight um, with that. And that's why you know I take my hats off to both guys. Berger, another guy that you know, Steve especially really never broke into the big money in this sport, um, but he always left it in the ring. Yeah. Yeah, you can definitely. Are you able to study like film in this era? Of are you able to find footage of guys or? Oh, gee, I mean, it was if you did, it was a VHS tape. I mean, this was before. I mean, gosh, I, I suppose this was like the internet. I mean, YouTube was maybe around, but I don't even really. Yeah, it yeah, was no, the. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's Steve being effective with that one two again. Yeah, he's he's. Yeah, I'm kind of working the inside clinch work, and Steve is definitely making use of that reach. So, kind of got a bit bit of a battle going on with with these positions. Yeah, it's a it's it's an interesting thing because at this point, there was you know, it, if it wasn't a VHS, it was you know a CD or DVD, you know, kind of thing where it was like, and that was the new technology kind of thing, you know. I, uh, I had to buy a DVD player for the first time because. Hook and shoot didn't sell video tapes. <laughs> yeah, at some point Jeff transitioned, and 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 you know a lot of these were made at home. He he would make the VHSs at home, and then you know when he gets the DVD uh, player, you know it, it was kind of considered a big upgrade, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, very interesting work being done here so far. Predominantly. A stand-up fight. Aaron did get that early knee sweep, as he mentioned, and got him down. Did a little bit of damage, maybe on the ground, but then let Berger back up. Aaron, you always considered yourself a, a, a boxer judo guy at the very beginning. Talk a little bit about your background. You said you won gold gloves. Talk, talk, talk about that. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, my early background with all of this was um, 
I was competing in each thing kind of individually. And I was really just kind of tying it all together when I would do an MMA match. I mean, I, I started out in judo and high school wrestling and American style kickboxing, like with you kind of like the boots and the kicks around requirement and all that stuff. So I kind of started off with those things. And then I was kind of able to um, meld them all together when I would compete in mixed martial arts. And I mean, I, um, I did compete and we got the end of the round here. Um, we have, um, yeah, I did compete in golden gloves though at, uh, yeah, I transitioned into boxing after I competed in kickboxing for a while. Cause I just kind of wanted to continue to challenge myself and I was becoming more aware of, of other groups that were competing in things. So I was joining, you know, any, any kind of fight uh, group that I could, that I could align myself with because I wanted to compete as much as possible and learn as much as possible to get ready for the UFC. That was always my goal. That was my whole reason for everyone to compete in this stuff. Do, were you thinking about, you, cause you, you turned it into a career, um, you know, and I know you obviously you still teach and things like that. Were you at this point set on being a, a martial artist uh, kind of, for for life for career or was it still kind of like a hobby oh no i mean i i knew that that's what i wanted to do ever since i saw the first uh, ufc it was just it was to get in and win the ufc that was always my goal and i just was kind of you know i guess taking small steps towards uh towards trying to make that happen so when, when was the first time they ever contacted you like about inter expressing interest because this was this went a long way towards everybody on Sure Dog chirping that you guys both belonged in the UFC. Well, and and actually, in in a stroke of good luck, uh, uh, Joe Selva was actually present for this fight. Miguel, I don't know if you remember that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Silva was actually present and saw this fight. He actually did the post fight interview um, and some VHS versions of the tape. You know that's included. And um, so, yeah, he was here. He was there at the event and got a, you know, front row seat. Yeah, it was uh, less than a year later. Uh, uh, both guys would make UFC appearances, uh, Aaron and Steve, uh, based on that. And and this is back in the days. Keep in mind, this is August of 2000. So this is pre-Fertitas and pre-Dana White, where, you know, the, you know, for lack of a better term, that when those guys bought the UFC, it became a little bit more corporate and they controlled things a little bit better. Made you know, kept things loose, and, and Joe wouldn't be making appearances at regional shows anymore. Um, but uh, at this point, we had there was a, a camaraderie, and Joe, uh, I think was a, I, I, I could say was a hook and shoe fan. He liked what we were doing, and he certainly, um developed a relationship with Aaron where I, I believe that they probably at times even, you know, talked on the phone or had conversations of, of that nature, um, you know, without the matchmaker Miguel, you know, in the way or, or in between and stuff. I, I think that you could say they were friends at some point. Um, and that has yeah. to do with Aaron's heart. You know, what we're watching here in the fight is obviously um, these guys are banging it out and it, you know, the, the style wise, uh, what's not to like, you know what I mean? It's like, so um, I, I think Joe is a eye for talent, recognized that, you know, on the regional level, we're doing good things here. And, and Aaron, Aaron deserved the attention uh, that he got. And, and Aaron, what was your first uh, UFC appearance after this? You, you fought in that uh, UFC 37.5, right? It was, it well, was no, 30, 37 was actually my first one. And in and, and, and an interesting uh, coincidence, uh, Burger was actually on that one as well. Um, so I don't, you know, wow, we would have to verify this with, uh, you know, the internet. But I mean, I would say that uh, that may have been, I'm not certain if that was Burger's first appearance in UFC or he maybe had one before that. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at it. It looks like Steve actually fought um, at UFC 31 as well. Tony D'Souza, right? With his yeah. Day D'Souza was his debut, like so. He he, that was in May of two thousand one, about le less than a year after this fight, and then so uh, and you fought Robbie Lawler, right? That's right. Yeah, I, I had Lawler, and then uh, um, Burger was facing off against Benji Raddick, so we both had some pretty heavy-handed opponents. Then, 
<laughs> and and guys much bigger than you, really. Yeah, I mean, you guys both, uh, you settled in, you know, once the professionalism kicked in and stuff, you settled in as a 155-pounder where, yeah. you know, you probably belonged. But here you were fighting at 170, and, you know, Lawler's a big 170. Lawler, you know, w- wasn't uncomfortable at 185. Like you said, very heavy-handed. Radic, another guy you probably trained with as well, who's huge. Oh, it yeah. looks like uh, looks like you got a little bit. This is shooto rules that we were using at this point in hook and shoot. So you just saw Berger get knocked down, and he is taking a standing A count. Um, I don't think, you know, I think it was a good exchange, a good uh, uh, punch that, that uh, Aaron landed. I'm not sure that Steve... Um, I'm not sure you would have finished Steve if the fight had not taken the A count, you know, because, but Steve did get you down at this point because maybe he didn't like the punching. Um, and what that will do is um, give you a 10, eight round in this one for the knockdown so far. So yeah. th- you, you, the first round I consider very even, um, obviously we were watching it here, um, but that is going to be a good thing. Steve now on top, well, what'd you think of Steve's jiu-jitsu? Because with Rodrigo Vaghi and stuff like that, you know, his, his jiu-jitsu was no joke either. No, his jiu-jitsu was very solid. I mean, I didn't, I knew that coming in, but yeah, we just sort of settled into this, this, uh, you know, non-verbalized agreement to just stand up and be it like, out. Yeah. yeah. Old school brawl. You don't see fights like this anymore. But, I mean. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, he went for the, foot lock or the, or the heel hook and that led to you getting back up and we're right back into the mode here Steve's starting to add some uppercuts do you remember um, I, like he's been effective with scoring you know for the judges and things like that at, at moments you just got another takedown and now you're on top again um, and you know kind of settling in for your 10-8 round um, but do you remember getting rattled at any point or, or, or getting hit hard enough that that you were worried at some point or how was, how was that exchange? Cause you seem to just be coming forward the, the whole time, Aaron. Yeah. I don't remember. remember any, any shots that especially like wobbled me or rocked me really bad. I mean, you know, he had, he had good, you know, good striking, but I mean, like, like I just was saying a minute ago, I mean, when Lawler was punching me, that was, that was the thing where it was, I was looking to not get any more of those at all. I was trying to not <laughs> forward. So, but uh, yeah, and then you know Holman kept yelling from the corner at the end of every round, "Go for the takedown, go for the takedown." So I kind of you know, w- I was just looking for the takedown to try and change things up, and uh, it was kind of still still the victory in the judges' mind at the end of the rounds there to steal the rounds, so to speak. Yep. How and tired we're... are you after two rounds of that crazy pace right there? Well, yeah, I mean, I luckily I was a young guy, so I was. Um, I was still able to kind of bounce back. It didn't affect me too bad. I felt like that I still, you know, I still had decent cardio. And, I mean, you know, to, to a certain degree, and some of my opponents had, had even mentioned that that was sort of one of my strengths, according to them, was that I would continue to get stronger as the fight wore on. And um, so, yeah, I, I was kind of blessed in that sense, I guess, that I didn't. You, 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 you did, did, you did have that reputation. He's got. You know, especially with a guy like Berger here who's doing more accumulation punches and stuff, Aaron is an iron chin guy. You know, I mean, in, in you know, 50 fights in his career, yeah, you could point to one or two fights where, you know, you know, he was facing a heavy-handed guy and it didn't go his way or whatever. But in general, he was very rarely, you know, on Queer Street for a long period of time in the fights. And, and yeah. that'll wear you down, you know. Steve is, is a good boxer, but... He's just got this guy in his face coming forward. Um, we are watching the replay here. We're already in the round three. We're in the replay. We got to see when Aaron trapped him in the corner and uh, got off a good three, four punch combination that dropped Steve. You know, that's got to be demoralizing to, to, you know, be hitting a, a guy for like eight or nine minutes and, and have him still coming forward, you know. And that was part of what Aaron did is uh, keep a murderous pace. Um, and never appear really hurt, you know, especially when, when we were on, at this level coming up and stuff, that was his bread and butter, you know, even we made reference to maybe the Eve Edwards fight already. 
uh, that happened, you know, that, that was a fight where Aaron needed a dentist afterwards. You know what I mean? But it didn't show during the fight. He didn't, not, not for a second did he, you know, back off or, or, or appear hurt, even though, you know, a lot of people might have quit that fight because of the damage he took, you know? We, uh, we heard the rumors that he broke something afterwards and nobody believed it. So yeah, I, I did an uppercut that, that Eve threw in that fight. He kind of, it broke uh, a portion of my of my lower palate. So it was kind of like the the bone that holds all your teeth in there. Uh, it broke a little portion of that. And for my four bottom teeth, they kind of, uh, you know, when it broke, they just kind of rocked back a little bit. So all together in unison. So they, when I went to the oral surgeon afterward, he kind of had to make a little adjustment there and uh, get that put back in place. So it was, uh, yeah, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't fun, but. Um, you at, know, at what point in the fight did that happen? Cause nobody. Oh, that was I the mean... second. Um, that was when he throws that tremendous flurry at the end of the second round. It happened in the midst of that, and then I was able to kind of maintain my my you know my wits and make it back to the corner. And I was kind of talking to Matt Hume about it, and Hume was like, "Well, your roommate's a dentist. You'll be fine. Go back out there." And I was like, "Ah, okay." So I just kind of bit down as best I could with my broken teeth on the mouthpiece and went back out there for the next round. Yeah, and that that you know that's the kind of heart that they're showing here. Now, finally, in the third round, they're doing a little bit more groundwork here. Um, maybe they've gotten a little bit tired of, of punching each other in the face, um, you know. And uh, Steve is working to to get down, but you can see Aaron has been working on his uh, groundwork as well, and uh, he's doing a good job of actually, you know. Even though he's on the bottom, kind of, or, or or working to get out of the bottom, he's not taking any damage here. Steve is is more maybe trying to control position and not getting any ground and pound off, so to speak. And that's because Aaron's good work here. Yeah, it's kind of tough to get to push into the ropes, to kind of get back up to your feet. There's no cage, so it's hard to yeah. regain uh, your footing there. Did you prefer fighting in the ring or a cage? You know, wow. I mean, I got so used to fighting in the ring that I was accustomed to it. And the cage was kind of a new thing at first. But, you know, I kind of just adapted to whichever whichever I was put in. But, I mean, at this stage now, I'm more used to fighting in a cage. And I like that ability to to use the cage to your advantage because I've been doing – I had done that for years. So, mm. yeah. it's a It's a different really? ballgame. The, the reason we chose a ring – other than, you know, the practical nature of we had a ring, you know what I mean? Um, is I, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't like that in, in this era, you would see a guy like Matt Hughes get a takedown in the middle of the ring and then, or in the middle of the cage in the UFC and then drag his opponent so he can crunch him up against the cage. Right. I, I, I thought that, and, and that leads to that position where the camera is getting a lot of butt with, a, you know, and, and that kind of thing. And so, that position in particular, I find it, I found to be displeasing, and I think also in general, unless you're really close for the crowd, it's a better view of the fighting in a ring. Um, so that's why we I, I always use the ring, even um, when we got to be on bigger shows and things. I know Jeff eventually also used cage and hook and shoot and things like that, but when it came down to, um. You know my my fights and things. I always did them in a ring. I, I I I always found the ring to be more appealing. Well, we're gonna we're looking at highlights at this point. The fight's over. It is a full three round fight. I think we've seen an action packed fight where the guys were exchanging pretty much the whole time. They both um got takedowns at some point or other. I think you could say Aaron probably got the lead on the takedowns. Aaron also got a ten eight round with a knockdown in the second round. Um, Aaron, was there any doubt in your mind at this point when you're, you're going to go raise your hand, getting the hands raised? Were you worried that Berger might have eked this one out, or how, how were you feeling? Were you feeling confident? Do you remember? I was feeling confident, but at the same time, when it goes to a judge's decision, you can never really be certain. I mean, luckily, I hadn't gone to too many judges' decisions at this point in my career, so I felt confident that I that I had done enough to win. So I just was assured. Well, I'm probably going to get the victory in my mind. Um, but you can never be positive, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it was, it was a good fight and I definitely, you know, was, was willing to grant him a rematch that never really materialized, but 
we uh, speak about it in the interview afterward that Silva conducted. And I told him, I, I, or, you know, we talked about it on camera and I was completely willing to give him a rematch because I felt like it was a close matchup. And um, I know that everyone would be interested in seeing it happen again. So I was open to it. If we j- and I know he was too. He definitely was after the decision. But um, I, I, I can honestly say that uh, if there was going to be a rematch, it, uh, it, it should have been on a bigger stage. You know what should I mean? It should have been on a bigger stage. And I'm comfortable with our stage being a regional show and things. Uh, the referee raised both guys' hands um, as a decision before the decision was announced because um, the crowd was certainly happy and the crowd was certainly letting both guys know that uh, that they've been entertained by the fight. And uh, eventually they do raise Aaron's hand here. I think we've seen a hook and shoot classic there, guys. You know what I mean? And, and being joined by Aaron is definitely a, a treat. Um, I want to thank my guy, Genghis, uh, for joining us on this one, as usual. And I want to thank you, Aaron, for joining us. I think, um, you know, it's a flashback to the old days. It fights 23 years old at this point. When was your last fight? What, what, what year did you retire? 2013 was the last one from me. So, uh yeah, it was, a, it was a fight night that they, they had for UFC out in Seattle. My career kind of came full circle. I, you know, went uh, out to Seattle to train for the big time fights. And I went back and I went out to Seattle and competed in my last big time fight. So it was, uh, that was it for me, 2013. 2013. And that's a, more than a dozen years after the fight we just saw. So, you know, you definitely put in uh, more almost two decades of fighting uh, for a career. Where are, you, where are you now? You live in Maryland? Yeah, well, I'm in the, I'm in Northern Virginia at the moment, and then I I'm assisting and and doing some training out here, but uh, uh, just out here, kind of pursuing some other career options and things, and then uh, you know training with uh, training with some of the j- local gyms here and helping out some friends. So yeah, I'm, I'm always not far away from MMA and Jiu Jitsu. So what what is the recovery time for a fight like that? Like, how do you feel for the next week or two? <laughs> you know. As a young guy, it really, I would bounce back from it super fast. Nowadays, I have no clue. I'd be in bed for, I don't know that I'd ever get out of bed. I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, but when I was younger, I mean, I, I, it was, you know, I was ready to go again the next day because I was just, <laughs> just at that age. That's what you guys were built differently back then. I even even a fight like this with Burger, where it was, you know, you were banging on each other, you know, the body blows and, and things like yeah. that. It's like, you know, I, I remember reading, uh, um, you know, old newspapers about Jack, the Jack Dempsey boxing era. And one of the guys that Jack Dempsey fought, a guy named Willie Meehan, uh, uh, Willie was asked, Dempsey was heading into a big fight, I think against Tommy Burns and um, Willie had fought both of them. So he was asked, you know, what, how he thinks it's going to go. And he, he, he Willie Mia actually had a win over Jack Dempsey on the local circuit too. Um, and he said Jack Dempsey hit him with a body shot that he felt for two years. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like some of those body shots and things like that are, are deceiving. <laughs> Even after a fight like this, you were back in the gym on Monday. Yeah. I mean, from what I remember, I mean, I, I might've uh, been, you know, you're always a little banged up and kind of working around something, but, yeah, I mean, it wasn't until a little later in my career that I kind of had things that kind of la- would last and linger a little bit more, you know, where you're absorbing more damage and things like that. So, I, I mean, I got to just say, I mean, you know, I got to thank God I've been pretty lucky that uh, I have kind of gone through a lot of injuries in my career, you know, I had definitely a handful, but I mean, I'm still pretty healthy and I'm not really kind of... Um, sidelined with any of the stuff from the past or anything, you know, currently. So I just really appreciative for that. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. And your guy, your guy that had his draw wired shut a couple of times, you know, which yeah. I, that's unpleasant. <laughs> Two times. Yeah, I hope, hope that a great distinction in UFC is being the only guy that's had my jaw fracture there twice. So not the UFC record I would like to have, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Aaron, it definitely was a treat to catch up and see you again. Um, always great um, to just hear your voice and obviously to share insights with you on the fights. Uh, when Genghis joins me, I know that Genghis also enjoys it. Um, he mentioned he's a lifelong fan of yours. 
and it's always a pleasure uh, to catch up with you. Uh, we've seen Steve Berger versus Aaron Riley from August 19th of 2000, a hook and shoot classic here on the MMA Museum and uh, the MMA Fight Review. So thank you guys. I'm going to cut this one short. Thank you.